This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Nermin Sheikh. We turn now to Kenya, which has begun three days of mourning for at least 67 people who were killed in the siege of the Westgate Mall in Nairobi. The Somali militant group al-Shabaab claimed responsibility for the coordinated attack. The death count could still rise if more hostages and their attackers are found buried in the rubble of the mall's three floors that collapsed. On Tuesday, Kenyan President Uhuru Kenyatta declared final victory four days after the attack began. Ladies and gentlemen, as I had vowed earlier, we have ashamed and defeated our attackers. That part of our task has been completed by our multi-agency security team. Five terrorists were killed with gunfire. Eleven suspects are in custody in connection with the attack. Intelligence reports had suggested that a British woman and two or three American citizens may have been involved in the attack. We cannot confirm the details at present, but forensic experts are working to ascertain the nationalities of the terrorists. Kenyan President Uhuru Kenyatta, since the attack on the Westgate Mall, survivors have started to share their accounts of what happened. This is Ali Manji, who, along with his wife, was helping to run a children's cooking competition at the mall before the attackers struck. And, and he turned and he said, you did not spare our women and children. Why should we, Why should we spare yours? And his colleague opened fire. They weren't shooting to scare, they were shooting to kill. They aimed low at where the people were crouching and they just opened fire completely and absolutely this is not islam islam is something else altogether islam is peace islam is about togetherness humanity what i saw there was not islam and if you ever ever think for a minute that those people represent us they don't they never will and please don't let them win by thinking it. One of the victims in the attack on the mall in Nairobi, the Somali militant group al-Shabaab, claimed responsibility for the attack via Twitter. In a series of messages, the group described the assault on the mall as revenge for Kenya sending troops into Somalia in 2011. To talk more about the situation there, we're joined by Jeremy Scahill, national security correspondent for The Nation, producer and writer of the documentary film and book, Dirty Wars, The World is a Battlefield. He has spent time in both Kenya and Somalia while working on Dirty Wars. Jeremy Skeho, welcome back to Democracy Thank Now! You. It's great to have you here. Can you talk about what's happened there? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, right now there, um, there's not just one al-Shabaab. Um, you know, I think there's, there's been a real fracture within the organization. And uh, a few weeks ago, the most high-profile American jihadist that was operating with al-Shabaab, Omar Hamami, uh, who was from Alabama, um, and was sort of like a rapper and propagandist for al-Shabaab, um, was killed, and it, it appears that he was killed by a rival faction of the group. And I think part of what we're seeing is that the um, the the section of Shabab that is more um, aligned with the global vision of uh, what, what was Osama bin Laden's Al Qaeda network um, and Ayman al Zawahiri's mission is trying to make a mark for itself. And I think that it's um, it's a group that's very much in trouble internally in Somalia, and I think it's trying to project that it has a more uh, globalist jihadist agenda. And so this attack. Um, on the Westgate Mall, um, I, I, th I think was indicative of the fact that there there are multiple versions of Al Shabaab. One part of Al Shabaab is primarily focused on Somali politics and taking power within Somalia, and the other is uh, is intent on sort of making a name for itself as a global terrorist player. And I think that's part of what we saw here at Westgate Mall. And the issue of Americans involved in Al Shabaab. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, there's there's been anywhere from, you know, a couple dozen to, you know, 50 or 60 um, Americans that have gone to Somalia to um, work alongside or fight alongside al-Shabaab or other militant organizations. Um, you know, many of them have come from uh, the state of Minnie of uh, Minnesota. Um, and, you know, the, the Somali-American community, I was there recently, um, is, is really caught in a difficult position because, on the one hand, they're being targeted by federal uh, agents and they're being targeted by surveillance and they have their mosques and their community organizations being surveilled. On the other hand, people in that community are very concerned about the fact that young people are being recruited. 
um, from, uh, you know, Minneapolis to go to Somalia. There have been several young Somali Americans who have uh, acted as suicide bombers, um, trying to blow themselves up at the or blowing themselves up at the gates of uh, the uh, the U.S.-backed African Union forces that are in Somalia or attacking uh, Somali government ministries. Um, you know, and 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 on the one hand. You know, this is a real problem that you have uh, have these young people that are that are being recruited and going over there. On the other hand, there's been this incredible overreaction to it, and I think a lot you know immigrant communities are being targeted for this. And in the whole scheme of things, it's a relatively uh, small problem. Um, but I think that there's you know Representative Peter King has just been you know who's you know the uh, the uh, the informal chair of the Islamophobe uh, caucus in Congress, you know, has really uh, sort of tried to t try to paint this as like you know some kind of boogeyman on steroids. But I mean, it's a real issue. But I think that um, you know the 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 fact that the Somali community in in Minneapolis is under this kind of intense scrutiny right now um, is is unjust on, on the one hand. On the other hand, um, they've really been unified in speaking out and demonstrating against what happened um, at the Westgate Mall. And what do you think, Jeremy, contributed to the expansion of Al Shabaab and to the splintering of which uh, you spoke? Right. I mean, all of a sudden now we have, you know, we have like, a, you know, like seahorses where you pour the thing in and it creates seahorses. We have that with like the terrorism expert industry now. Everybody knows everything about Al Shabaab, and yet there's very little context given to this. I mean, one of the things that I get into in in my book, in Dirty Wars, is where Al Shabaab came from. Uh, you know, in in uh, in the early 2000s, the Bush administration made a disastrous decision to put all of these warlords on the CIA payroll. And they, they came up with this name called the Alliance for the Restoration of Peace and Counterterrorism. And, uh, and I tracked down some of these warlords when I was in Somalia and, and in Kenya. Um, and they basically had them acting as, a, as, a, as an assassination squad. Um, most Somalia experts said that there were no more than a dozen al-Qaeda-connected uh, individuals in Somalia right after 9-11. Um, and, and so the CIA hires these warlords ostensibly to go and hunt these people down. Well, they end up murdering vast numbers of people who were imams or religious scholars. And in some cases, I was told that they, they would literally like chop people's heads off and then bring them to their American liaisons and say, this is so and so and I've and I've killed him. Um, and so you had the, the, this utterly thuggish collection of warlords murdering people and doing so, they believed, with the backing of the United States of America, the most powerful nation in the world. Um, that sparked then a, um, a, a revolt against the warlords. And so what happened was that these coalitions of religious figures from different regions of Somalia formed something called the Islamic Courts Union. Um, and basically these were, it was 12 Sharia courts, meaning that there were, there were 12 regional authorities who had imposed some version of, uh, of law in the areas that they controlled. They came together and united as one body, and they started to pool their resources in an effort to overthrow the CIA's warlords from Mogadishu. There was a 13th unofficial member of the Islamic Courts Union, and that was Harakat Shabab al-Mujahideen, which is the which is al-Shabab, and so al, and al-Shabab was the only faction within the Islamic Courts Union that had any presence of foreign fighters, and they were the least powerful. They had the least credibility in Somalia, the least visibility, and so when the Islamic Courts Union took Mogadishu, they expelled the CIA warlords. They they imposed a brutal but uh, but effective form of governance on Mogadishu, effective in the sense that it stabilized the city. Crime rates plummeted. They reopened the ports. Um, you know, there were also uh, all sorts of, uh, you know, vicious, violent punishments meted out against people who violated what they perceived to be, you know, the tenets of Islamic Sharia law. Um, but it was, I mean, uh, most, I mean, almost everyone except probably Bush-era officials would agree that it was the only moment from the time Siad Bari's regime fell in the early 1990s until 2006 that there was anything vaguely resembling stability in Mogadishu. The CIA's warlords are, are kicked out. The Islamic Courts Union is in control. The U.S. then covertly partners with the Ethiopian dictatorship. Um, and Ethiopia launches an overt invasion of Somalia to overthrow the Islamic Courts Union. Um, and, you know, the fact that they were called Islamic, probably, you know, Bush is like batting, uh, you know, a ball of yarn in the back while Dick Cheney's running the country, and they hear Islamic, and it's like, oh, we got to overthrow them. So they, you know, I mean, that's basically what happened. It was this knee-jerk reaction. I mean, if you actually look at the people that made up the Islamic Courts Union, there was a mishmash of people. Yes, there were people that were extremists, but most of them were not. Most of them were people that more closely resembled the Taliban government, not the Taliban movement, but 
but the Taliban government. I mean, it's, you know, by all standards, a brutal form of government, but these were not people that wanted to attack the United States at all. There was no U.S. interest in doing this except for knee-jerk sort of neocon reactionary politics. So they overthrow that government. Um, and then JSOC, the Joint Special Operations Command, and the CIA use the cover of this over-invasion to go in and start hunting people. And they want to take out all of the leaders of the Islamic Courts Union. They're looking for people that were attack, uh, involved with the 98 bombings of the U.S. embassies in Kenya and Tanzania. And they start this assassination campaign. And they use drones, and they're using um, AC-130 gunships. And, uh, and basically, the Islamic Courts Union is totally dismantled. Somalia then returns or reverts to this state of you know, brutality and civil war. And you then have the Ethiopians committing rape, murdering civilians, torturing people, setting up their own prisons, rendering people back to Ethiopia. It, it becomes an utter disaster. And what ends up happening is that Shabab, this group of relative nobodies for so many years who were sort of on the periphery of this movement start to say, well, we will be the vanguard in the fight against the U.S.-backed Ethiopian invasion, and we will take up arms, and we will defend Somalia. And they started uh, mixing together the, the ideas and rhetoric of Osama bin Laden with a sort of Somali nationalist uh, politics, and, and end up getting a tremendous amount of support, because they were the only people fighting. And, and so what happened there, I mean, this is incredible, is that Osama bin Laden tried to take uh, credit for the Black Hawk Down incident, you know, in the early 1990s, and it was a complete lie. I mean, he had they had nothing, you know, to do with it. Maybe there were some people that were could reasonably be called jihadists that were involved with that, but it it, had, it was not Osama bin Laden's plot. And yet, Osama bin Laden had tried to take responsibility for it. 18 U.S. soldiers were killed, but also thousands of Somalis. Oh yeah, I mean, thousands and thousands of Somalis were yeah were were killed. Uh, I mean, it was it was. I mean, it's it's basically one of the only things most people know about Somalia was Black Hawk Down, and most people don't even know. It's like when we talk about the Vietnam War, people know, you know, that there. There were 65,000 U.S. troops killed. Do people know that multi-million uh, Vietnamese were killed? It's the same with the Black Hawk Down incident. I mean, thousands of Somalis were butchered, uh, you know, in the aftermath when of the that. When the U.S. Uh, uh, helicopters came in. Yeah, the U.S. helicopters came in. They were, they were hunting— This was under George H.W. Bush. Uh, right. And it, well, uh, it was President Clinton ended up pulling the, the uh, Army Rangers and the whole U.S. presence out of, uh, out of Somalia, but the, they were hunting Mohammed Farah Idid, this, you know, this warlord, um, who had basically destroyed Mogadishu and created the situation where you had this civil war in Somalia. Um, but, the, but the point I'm getting at here is that al-Shabaab uh, was you know, a, a, a largely a non-player in Somalia, and al-Qaeda had almost no presence there. And the U.S., by backing these warlords and then overthrowing the Islamic Courts Union, made the very force that they claimed to be trying to fight the most powerful force in Somalia. But what is at stake uh, for the U.S. in East Africa and the Horn of Africa? What what are their interests there? Well, I mean, I think I think initially it started with uh, you know with a sort of knee jerk reaction to 9/11, and you know I mean the the fact was that uh, there were there were major terrorist uh, events that happened. As a, as a result of Somalia's lawless situation, there were people being harbored in Somalia that were involved with the 98 embassy bombings, and I think I think that you know Rumsfeld and Cheney uh, early on after 9/11 developed this uh, program called Next Steps, and they were were uh, citing all these countries that they intended to go into, and Somalia was on the early list of of countries, and you know you had the State Department, Colin Powell, and others cautioning against it and saying we shouldn't go in here, but there were people in the Pentagon who wanted to run the deck all over the world and wanted to send people in there, and so you know I mean I, I think part of it there's there are natural resources in Somalia. It has the largest coastline of any nation in Africa. Um, there's a very potentially lucrative fishing industry that exists there. It's part of why you see the rise of piracy, is that European and other uh, shipping companies are, are coming in. They're dumping in the Somali waters, but also illegal fishing is happening all the time. When people eat lobster and they're told it's Kenyan lobster, it, uh, it almost certainly is actually from the Somali coastline or from the Somali waters. So, I mean, I don't, I don't think that there's some nefarious conspiracy behind the scenes, but Somalia if Somalia was a stabilized country, um, there's tremendous natural resources and wealth in Somalia. But I think it has more to do with this narrow U.S. view of, um, of terrorism being this epic global threat and, and reacting in that way constantly or consistently. Jeremy, I want to turn to a clip of your film, um, and then we're going to talk about President Obama's address yesterday at the U.N. General Assembly. And one correction, Black Hawk Down, as you said, that happened, that period in 1993 was under President Clinton. But in your new documentary, uh, that's now just going to be released on DVD, Dirty Wars, The World is a Battlefield. You meet the notorious Somali warlord in Daadi, who is working with the United States. This is a clip.
In an earlier life, Inda Ade had been America's enemy, offering protection to people on the U.S. kill list. But the warlord had since changed sides. He was now on the U.S. payroll and assumed the title of general. So he's saying that the fiercest fighting that they're doing right now is happening right here. The men fired across the rooftops, but it didn't make sense to me what we were doing here or what the Americans were doing here in Somalia, arming this warlord turned general for what seemed like a senseless war. We gotta move. So these were Shabab fighters you buried here? If we capture fighters alive, we give them medical care. Unless they are foreigners, the foreigners we execute. If you capture a foreigner alive, you execute them on the battlefield? Uh, yes, the others should feel no mercy. From the film Dirty War, is written by Jeremy Scahill, directed by Rick Rowley, Jeremy. Yeah, I mean, this is part of what the U.S. is doing right now. They have this huge counterterrorism base that they've built at the airport in uh, Mogadishu, and they're paying Somali thugs, basically, to go out and do the bidding of the United States. So we're, we're basically back to where we are when Donald Rumsfeld and Cheney and others decided to start arming and backing warlords. I mean, it's just Som Somalia is just an utter hell. And, um, you know, I mean, it's, there, it's some of the greatest suffering on planet Earth. And the U.S. has played a very significant role in destabilizing Somalia for many, many years. We're going to go to break, then come back to talk about President Obama's address yesterday at the U.N. General Assembly. Our guest is Jeremy Scahill, independent journalist, national security correspondent for The Nation, Democracy Now! correspondent and producer and co-writer of the documentary Dirty Wars, The World is a Battlefield. Stay with us.